Esteban Chavez um, works, as you can see, at uh, Absecori in Costa Rica, and he was there and came to UC Santa Cruz to do a PhD in seismology, which he finished uh, in 2018. And during that time, he worked on um, a host of different problems, um, a lot in Costa Rica looking at um, uh, details of seismicity following the 2012 large earthquake, um, using um, repeating earthquakes to in improve a catalog, but also to uh, look at um, stress drop variations after that uh, large event. Uh, he's got many, many interests, um, and uh, I'm really, um, yeah, he showed, uh, shared with me some of the data they collected here. Uh, on landslide in Irazu, and um, it's just fascinating. So um, I'm going to let him share that with you, or with all of us. Yes, thank you very much, Susan. Um, yeah, I'm super new to landslides. Um, I'm trying to, you know, get deep into uh, these kind of processes. Uh, I was most used to, or I'm much used to. Uh, Earthquakes and subduction zones and um, repeating earthquakes that happen in subduction zones. But it turns out that landslides uh, also host a good bunch of repeating earthquakes. And I'm going to show you this today. And um, I'm interested, interested in landslides because we can, you know, learn a lot from them and apply this uh, set of uh, concepts and uh, processes to uh, faults in trying to understand earthquake physics better in, in how earthquakes uh, prepare and then occur in these kind of uh, systems. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> let me show you the data that we have. And I'll be happy to do this in a very informal way. So if you have questions, you can uh, let me know. Or um, we can do it at the end of the, of the presentation that is not too long anyways. So feel free to interrupt if you if you will. Uh, just just for context, uh, Costa Rica is part of the Central American Volcanic Front and is formed by these uh, the subduction of the Cocos Plate um, that is subducting underneath the Caribbean Plate and the Panama Block right here in the south. The subduction rates change from eighty five to ninety millimeters per year. It is a very rapid subduction process and that generates earthquakes big earthquakes with magnitudes larger than seven uh, mainly uh, along the Nicoya Peninsula which is the northwestern section of the subduction zone and the Osa Peninsula which is located to the south of the country uh, at the border with Panama uh, if we have subduction we have volcanism as well and we have a very active uh, volcanic chain right here in the northwest part of the country and in the central part of the country. And today I'm going to focus on one volcano uh, that is here, is the Irasu volcano. It is located in the central valley of Costa Rica, where more than 70% of the population of the country uh, lives and the economy develops right here. And as you can see in this map to your right, um, this is the spatial distribution of uh, some of the stations or more, most of the seismic stations that we have installed in Opsicori uh, or we have deployed in Opsicori to, for monitoring the volcano, uh, Irasu volcano and Turrialba volcano right here. Um, the yellow triangles represent broadband seismic stations. Uh, the red lines correspond with uh, tect tectonic faults in alignments along the region. It is a very active region that hosts not, not just volcanic activity, uh, but a lot of tectonic earthquakes that happened here. In 2016, we had a big earthquake, minus 5.5 earthquake that occurred just in the middle of the two volcanoes. So it's a very complex region. Uh, with a lot of tectonic faulting and, and volcanic activity here. And also, this tectonic activity will affect the dynamics uh, of the internal dynamics of the volcano. The good thing is that we have the capabilities to go there and install a seismic station and record what is happening in a pretty good detail. I mean, we have incredible data set uh, 
from the Irasu volcano and to Rialba volcano as well. And this is in high detail. Um, there is a recent uh, paper, well, not recent, from 2015 that shows where is the structure of the volcano and the history of landslides. Faja et al. published a paper uh, in 2015 uh, showing the distribution of most of the landslides in this part of the Irasu volcano, which, which I'm showing you here in the right. Um, the color codes uh, for these maps represents uh, regions that are affected by erosion in pink, um, maybe in, in brown or in more darker colors are the regions are affected by landslides or mass movements, as they call it. Uh, regions less affected by erosion are, are showed in um, purple. And in gray, we have uh, regions that um, are, are basically stable, very, very stable. So as you can see, we have uh, a landslide, an hist historical landslide in the northern flank of the volcano, and then a pretty recent uh, region that has hosted uh, a several landslides since 2011, right here in the north, uh, northern or uh, northwestern flank of, of Irasu volcano. The last event happened in 2020, in August 2020, but this is a multi-episodic uh, process that has been recorded since, since 1994. Uh, in 1994, we had a, an event that happened in the northern flank of the volcano, right here, where, where you can see my mouse. And this event had a, an estimated volume of 22 times 10 to the 6, or 22 million meter cubes. In 2014, the, the landslide, or the record of, of a new landslide, um, was observed right here, where, where I'm showing you the start, uh, which, is, which is the place for the, the landslide in 2014, 2018, and 2020. In 2014, we had a landslide with an estimated volume of 28 million, uh, meter cube. In 2018, we had uh, um, 1,600 uh, meter cube, and in 2020, the largest uh, landslides, uh, it was uh, 25 million meter cube. So it's a big one. It's a big one. And we have the records, the seismic records for most of these events. And Unfortunately, the seismic network in 2011 wasn't that good, but we have some records that show that there there was an event in 2011, and they're not that good as the ones in 2014, 18, and 20, and 2020. Here in, to your right, I'm showing you uh, the place where the landslide in 1994 occurred. Uh, this has, these are the seismic records for the landslide in, in 1994, to, the, the first uh, seismogram that you can see represent this the, the recordings of this landslide in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, and a seismic station that wasn't a part of Opsicori network, but it was part of the of the um, geolo geology school in, in Universidad de Costa Rica. And then in 2014, we have the record of uh, the event that happened, but to the west of this uh, landslide in 1994, that also recorded at, it was recorded at the same station uh, in San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, the map that I'm showing you here in 2014 represents the region that um, has hosted or has uh, the, the epicenter of the largest events in 2014 and 2020. So it's a very active region, very complex as well. Um, and it hasn't it hasn't stopped. It's still going. And GPS stations are showing the evolution or the crustal deformation uh, in this particular region. Something that I didn't mention is that this is the place where a lot of telecommunication antennas and and TV uh, uh, stations. Uh, install their instrumentation for sharing information or for you know for communicating with with the country and all of them are being affected by by the occurrence of this landslide 
to the point that of course they have to move all the all the equipment and antennas to other parts of the of the summit just to keep with the transmission and, uh, and telecommunications. Uh, this is just for, for reference and context. This is a very cool video that Sidney uh, uh, um, Mueller from Opsicoria did with, um, with drones. He flew drones around the, the, the landslide in 2020 and is showing the dramatic collapse of the of of the flank with the with the landslide. So check it out. This is August nineteen, August twenty sixth, and look at this time. Here's when when you can see the crack starting in the in the flank of the volcano and how this crack is expanding and collapsing. So this is this video shows the deformation in the in the volcano or along the region where, where the landslide is is occurring right now. It's, it's very interesting. It's very it's very cool, and we are super lucky that we were able to record this not just seismically but with other instrumentations, GPS and other instrumentations as well. So, anyways, this is the the example of the seismic records that we have. Two stations. If you remember the maps, let me let me just go back just for one second. Uh, if you remember the map that I showed you before, we have three stations that are really close to the region where the landslide occurred in 2020, 2014, and 2018. A stations Vika, Aja, and Bide. And the data that I'm going to show you uh, is from those stations. Uh, here is the station Vide, the east component of the station Vide, and the station Vika. And this is for the landslide in 2014. Um, in the top panel, I'm showing you on a spectrogram, which is uh, the signal in the frequency domain that shows some of the features that cannot be seen in the time domain. So, for instance, if you can see in detail, you will see like regions with real with more intense um, energy than the background. Here in the spectrogram, the colors are are like this. Um, Black or dark regions represent uh, frequencies with low energy or um, non-energy at all. And the regions with bright colors represent the uh, frequencies that has most intensity or energy in the signal. So as you can see, we can see some sparks, um, kind of sparks uh, um, in the records this is three hours before the main collapse the main collapse is right here is a very is a region with a very intense energy and uh before the occurrence of this collapse we have the occurrence of some something happening uh just in the preparation um step of the landslide if we go to the time domain in the middle panel we see Almost the, the the seismic signal shows um, it's very it's very hard to see this the occurrence of these sparks or signals that are popping off before the occurrence of the main of the main rupture that is is very evident. The large amplitudes of the main event are you know obscuring the signals that are preceding this uh, dramatic collapse. But if we zoom in, we will see the occurrence of some. Uh, something that is happening that it seems like the occurrence of earthquakes and we, when we evaluate these earthquakes in detail we notice that these are very different events uh, different from uh, the regular dynamic uh, and tectonic earthquakes that we're used to see and they correspond with low frequency earthquakes so before the occurrence of the main collapse or the catastrophic collapse we have the occurrence of low frequency earthquakes that anticipate the rupture or the dramatic collapse in the in the event. Um, this is the process, as, as I mentioned before, this is the process for 2020 for 2014. 
and the signal the signal is showing three hours before the main collapse but let me go back uh, let me go to uh 2020 if you compare the figures they are very similar but for my taste i think 2020 is even even more dramatic and beautiful compared to 2000 and compared to the event in 2014 here there is more clear that uh, there is something going on in the preparation of the big collapse um and let me let me just break down this figure a little bit for you we have the occurrence of uh, low frequency earthquakes which are these sparks or signals that you ever, you cannot see in the time domain but in the frequency domain they they show up beautifully and then you see how the frequency of these low frequency earthquakes start increasing as a function of time till they merge together and form a signal that we call tremor and this tremor anticipates the occurrence of the collapse in 2020. Um, if we zoom in again, if we go to the middle panel, either for for Aja, for Station Aja, or for Station Bika, we see the occurrence or the, the rupturing of these events, which represent the stick-slip process along the uh, landslide plane. Uh, zooming in, 30 minutes, around 30 minutes before the landslide, we see clearly the collapse, the time, the, or the, the proximity of the low frequency earthquakes. Um, at the mark of 30 minutes, it is impossible to separate the low frequency earthquakes. They merge together, and the, the, the coda part of the low frequency earthquake merge with the initial part of the next event, and it's basically impossible to separate. I went back in time, and I extracted, extracted 330 low frequency earthquakes uh, two days before the occurrence of the, of the landslide. Uh, but 30 minutes before the occurrence of the event, it is impossible to separate them. Uh, what, is, what is happening here is that uh, we start seeing the formation or the initiation of tremor. Uh, very similar to what we have learned or observed in subduction zones or tectonic faults elsewhere. Um, and there is something more interesting in this part. We see that the tremor increases in amplitude, increases exponentially in amplitude. And we wonder what is happening here and why uh, the tremor is increasing in amplitude. But after increasing exponentially, uh, the amplitude decays dramatically, like stop, something, something in the process stops and the amplitude goes back to zero or go, goes back to very low levels and then we have a period of stability and then the final, the final unstable collapse or the catastrophic collapse. Okay. So if, if you allow me to go back a little bit just to, to describe the, the low frequency earthquakes. I, I mentioned that we found uh, for the 2020 event, we found, we found 330 low frequency earthquakes. These events have magnitudes between zero and two. We calculate these, uh, the magnitudes uh, doing a, a simple uh, calibration with the rest of the seismicity that is located in the, in the volcano. Uh, that we know very well the magnitude. So we calibrated the magnitude of these low frequency earthquakes. Um, based on the nature of the low frequency earthquakes, it is very hard to locate them and uh, calculate magnitudes based on um, traditional uh, methods that we use in observatories for, you know, characterizing the epicenter and, and the source of, of earthquakes. And um, here um, in the panel that is located at the bottom, you can see the intervent time in hours as a function of time from uh, August, 2000, uh, August 25th till uh, August 26th, uh, which is the occurrence of uh, the landslide right here. And beautifully, you can see a decrease in the intervent time, but it's almost linearly, um, behaves linearly with time. And um, we see so the progression of or the reduction of the intervening time as a function of time for the for the low frequency earthquakes. Among the 33, uh, uh, 330 uh, low frequency earthquakes, we have repeating earthquakes, and uh, these are events that occur 
in the same full patch or you know uh, approximately the same full patch and every time they happen or they occur we have a, f a, a waveform that is very very similar and um but what is a repeating earthquake anyways in uh, here i'm gonna invoke rate and state friction loss and uh, for those of you that are not familiar with rate and strict friction, I'm trying to summarize uh, summarize a little bit uh, what is rate and state friction. So let's consider a fault that has different frictional properties. This fault range uh, in great represented region with velocity strengthening frictional properties. This is region that is constantly sliding, and when it, when it slides, it does uh, a seismically doesn't radiate seismic waves okay that is constantly constantly sliding then within this gray region we have a region with velocity or a fault patch with velocity weakening properties um, that every time it goes off or rupture generates seismic waves so the velocity uh, the region with velocity strengthening frictional properties is constantly loading the edges of the fault patch in orange right? and it loads the region till the frictional strength of the fault patch cannot resist the shear stress imposed by the velocity strengthening or the creeping of uh, the rest of the fault and goes off and ruptures and if we're lucky enough to have seismic stations like the yellow triangles that i'm showing you here around the area where this event is happening or where the the orange patch is rupturing we can see that every time the, the orange uh, patch ruptures, generate seismic waves that are very, very similar. And if we, if we want to get fancy and calculate how similar they are, we will see, or we can measure that the correlation coefficient is larger than 0.95 or 0.97 or um, some high number for a, cor for a correlation coefficient. So this is a repeating earthquake. It's an event that is happening approximately in the same fault patch or the fault region. And every time it happens, generate a, a waveform that is identical to the, to the waveform that has happened in the past or previously. This is very useful because repeating earthquakes allow us to study how a fault region evolves over time, especially before, during, and after transient or stress transient events like earthquakes or landslides or any other episode that might change the attenuation or the mechanical properties of the region that we're interested in. Uh, these are the waveforms for one of the families that we found um, in the landslide in 2020. Remember that I, I, I show you a figure that this figure showing uh, 330 low frequency earthquakes represented by the red triangles right here uh, with the, their magnitude distribution. Uh, but among these 330 events, we have 10 families with repeating earthquakes. And the waveforms that I'm showing you here are or represent the waveforms for family two. And as you can see, they happen in different times um, before the occurrence of the landslide, of course, but they, they increase in time. And every time they, they occur, the waveforms are exactly the same or very, very similar uh, over time with small changes, especially along the coda of the, of the, of the signal. Um, ten families are occurring before the landslide. And um, when we examine the temporal distribution of the ten families of repeating earthquakes, they, they look like this. Uh, the first family, ironically, is called family two because this is the first... Uh, the second family that I found. Um, but family two is, starts in uh, August 14, uh, several days, so almost a week before the occurrence of the landslide in August 26th. And this is the evolution of the, in, in, the, in the panel uh, to the, to the, in, in the top or panel A is showing you magnitude as a function of time. Uh, these are days in August and it ends in uh, September 1st. Um, at the bottom, I'm showing you cumulative or the cumulative slip from the repeating earthquakes as a function of time as well. And, and here clearly you can see the evolution of the number of families as a function of time. As we are approaching to the final moment of the collapse, we see an increase 
exponential or dramatic increase in the number of families that are popping off or occurring along the landslide plane. And of course, they, they end or they terminate when, when, the, find, when the, the collapse finally happened. But then we have, uh, so we have uh, 10 families that are, we can use as a proxy for studying uh, future events like this. We can use repeating earthquakes for, or trying to understand the behavior of repeating earthquakes and repeating earthquake families to try to understand uh, these processes more in detail in the future. And we also could use these repeating earthquakes as marks to say, hey, something is happening and you better, you better put attention to the process that is occurring uh, along this place in particular. Um, let's see. Okay, so let me go back just for a, for a little bit to uh, this figure. Um, I showed you before the occurrence of the of the low frequency earthquakes right here at the top. Uh, they anticipate the occurrence of the of the catastrophic failure, but also we talk. We I said that thirty minutes before the earthquake, we have the formation of tremor, which is basically formed by uh, a lot of uh, low frequency earthquakes that are happening very close in time and space. They form a continuous signal that we call tremor. And the amplitude of the tremor increases exponentially. And why is that? Why the amplitude of the tremor is increasing? Uh, well, it turns out that amplitude is directly related to seismic moment or magnitude, in other words. And seismic moment depends on the rupture area and the average uh, rupture displacement or the, uh, the average slip of the fault. So if the fault increases or the fault area increases, uh, we will have uh, an increase in seismic moment. Or if the average rupture displacement increases over time, we will have an increase in seismic moment or a combination of these two could give us an increase in seismic moment. So here's my interpretation of what could be happening uh, during the process of generating low frequency earthquakes, and especially the increase, the, amp the, the exponential increase in amplitude in the tremor signal. So let's consider the figure to your left. This is what was happening uh, hours, let's, let's say days to hours before the occurrence of the collapse. We have a full plane, kind of, or, or a landslide plane that uh, we could use for uh, trying to create a model that help us to understand what happened. So in this particular model, the orange or the regions in orange represent those regions that behave with uh, different frictional properties. These are regions that uh, slide seismically or with velocity strengthening frictional properties. These regions are constantly sliding and evolving and driving the occurrence of small regions uh, with different with velocity weakening frictional properties. These are regions that are elastically coupled and radiate seismic waves when the shear stress uh, imposed by the velocity strengthening regions uh, overcomes the frictional strength of the of the fault patch. They go they go off. So the regions in red represent exactly that. Those regions that are elastically coupled that radiate seismic waves in, in the form of low frequency earthquakes. And um, these these happen under low strain conditions when the process is starting, um, when the, the loading rate is low. And as loading rate increases, we will see that some of the um, patches in white that represent patches or foil patches with different frictional properties, we call this um, um, conditional stable regions. They depend, they, their failure or the, their, their slip behavior will depend on the loading rate. Uh, if the loading rate is, is low, they will stay stable. They won't go off like in, in a dynamic rupture. But if the, if the strain is high and if the, if the loading rate is high, they will switch mode and then they will become in a, in a velocity weakening. They will be, become more unstable and, and will rupture in a velocity weakening uh, manner or with velocity weakening frictional properties. So in the right, you can see what happened right after or when, when, the, when the loading rate is high, when the strain is high, 
we see the conversion of a lot of these uh, uh, patches that previously were conditionally stable, all stable at all. So this process is called transient embrittlement. This is the, the switch or the conversion of the frictional properties of the full patches when they uh, feel a change in the, in, the, in the strain or the strain rate. This is predicted by rate and state friction, and it, it has been observed multiple times in laboratory experiments and numerical models uh, that show that a transient embrittlement is this uh, capacity that folds false regions have to uh, switch the their failure mode from a uh, stable manner with uh, velocity strengthening frictional conditions to an unstable manner with velocity weakening frictional conditions so what happened is that uh, when the strain is high we have a great amount of of full patches that have the capacity to go off seismically and they all contribute to the generation of low frequency earthquakes that uh, that get close together in the space and time and form the tremor signal this is my interpretation of the process and this is why the amplitude increases dramatically so the in general we have an increase in the rupture area because more or most or more patches are, are showing up are, are appearing uh, when uh, a strain is high compared to previous hours or days when uh, the loading the loading stress was low uh, along the along the landslide similar observations have been made in um, other regions like in Japan uh, Yamada Mori and Matsushi show uh, some similar data uh, where they analyze a landslide in Japan and they, they show the occurrence of uh, small earthquakes. I don't remember right now if they call it low frequency earthquakes. I need to double check this. But they, they observe the precursory seismic signals that happened before several landslide episodes, along with some tremor as well. Um, then Polly in 2017 also shows precursory seismic signals that anticipate the occurrence of a landslide in Greenland. He studies the, the, this process using one seismic station that was almost near or close to the, the landslide in Greenland. Um, it, it, it is not as close as we are. Uh, it is several kilometers away. We are meters away from the landslide in this particular case. But anyways, he observed the occurrence of uh, Earthquakes that increase in time, or the frequency of the earthquakes increases in time, but also the amplitude. So you can see an exponential increase in the amplitude before the collapse, uh, before this event in 2017. Um, and finally, Shopa et al. 2018 shows, no, they, they show seismic data along um, a region in, in Iceland where they study a landslide in a caldera, in a volcanic caldera. This region is different from the rest because it's influenced by uh, ice and, and rain and other other processes that happen that don't happen in in a subvolcano, for instance. Uh, but they showed a tremor signal that anticipates the landslide in 2018. Uh, they also showed an increase in the amplitude of the tremors. As you can see, tremor increases in amplitude and then decreases in amplitude. They don't explain the decrease in the amplitude um, uh, before the occurrence of the landslide. And uh, something that Irasu is kind of unique in all of these data sets. By the way, these are the three uh, published uh, papers that we can find about a landslide or seismic signals before the landslides. There are no more, to my understanding, I couldn't find any any other paper. Um, but if you you know about other paper, please let me know. This it is very, uh, it's very unique and it's, it's worth showing. I think uh, some of the the things that Irasu shares uh, between all of these or of the reason why Irasu is very unique is because we show everything or we recorded everything. We recorded the occurrence of uh, repeating earthquakes, low frequency earthquakes, tremor 
the increase in tremor and then the sudden stop of the tremor. This figure is showing you velocity in the y-axis and time or relative time um, with respect to the landslide in the x-axis and in colors I'm separating different frictional transitions. In green we have the, the part of the tremor signal which is represented by stick slip motion or slip and then in, in yellow or cream I'm showing you uh, where the tremor signal or the amplitude of the tremor signal uh, decreases dramatically to a very low levels and this process takes about 20 seconds 20 seconds and then in pink or in um, purple I, I'm showing you the part of the signal uh, for station Asia and Bika where we see the dramatic increase in amplitude uh, caused by the catastrophic failure of the landslide. So what is happening in these 20 seconds? This is, this period of time is per, is a time where there is stability, where the mass hasn't moved, hasn't detached, or hasn't fall yet. And what I think is happening is that the contribution for all of the I'm, I'm gonna let me put put it right here. Um, the sorry, this is not this one. This one. The contribution from all of these fall patches that change mode by transient embrittlement um, increase the frictional strength of the of the entire fall plane of the entire material or, or of the entire mass before collapsing. This frictional strength is enough to hold the mass for 20 seconds. Uh, but you know the the mass is still there are regions with different frictional properties and there is gravitational loading still going on and the frictional strength of the of the, the general friction strength uh, given by the, the individual full patches is not enough to sustain or to hold the entire mass that is coming down or the gravitational loading imposed um, uh, by the entire mass and the slow slip that is driven the, the sliding of the regions with a conditional stable sliding or velocity strengthening uh, frictional conditions. So in general, I believe that the, the frictional strength of the individual full patches are enough or are strong enough to sustain the mass for 20 seconds, reduce the amplitude of the tremor and provoke or generate instability for 20 seconds which is enough to reduce the time that we see in the in the seismic signal to bring the amplitudes to zero but then the the, the gravitational loading is so strong it's, it's imposing shear stress where the shear stress in these full patches is is big enough to overcome the frictional strength the entire frictional strength of the full patches and you know we have the dramatic collapse that we observe in the signal to summarize what we observed, let me show you this timeline. We have that at low strain rates when the landslide initiates, when we have the detachment and start the mass starts failing. Um, we have the appearance of discrete low frequency earthquakes triggered by slow slip. Remember that the fault or the region, the landslide uh, plane is uh, is very diverse. It hosts different slip modes from velocity strengthening to velocity weakening or regions with conditional stable sliding uh, properties that depend on the loading rate. So all of this contribute to uh, the generation of a slow slip that rupture or bring to rupture uh, patches that are elastically coupled and radiate seismic waves. These are the patches that generate the low frequency earthquakes that you can see right here and among them we have repeating earthquakes as the strain rate increases uh, we encounter a process that is called transient embrittlement that has to be that has to do with the stiffness of the material and the rheology of the material and the full patches that behave that previously behave in a more conditional stable manner uh, sliding in a more a seismic wave now they switch failure mode or slip mode and, and change to uh, rupture in a more velocity weakening manner radiating seismic wave. This contributes to the contributes to the generation of tremor and 
finally, when when uh, strain rates are super high, we have so many full patches that rupture in the same manner, forming tremor and increasing dramatically the amplitude of the tremor. 20 seconds before the occurrence of the catastrophic landslide, uh, we have the sudden um, reduction of the amplitude of the tremor, uh, getting to very low values, stabilizing, which indicates uh, that the system is stable at least for 20 seconds and this stability is related to the frictional properties of the of the of the full patches so the frictional strength that is enough to sustain the mass that is coming down but it's not enough to sustain it for the longer time and finally the gravitational loading and the slow slip that is happening uh, along the landslide plane you know just bring everything to the ground and the last light the landslide occurs and I think that's the, the observation that I wanted to share with you. And I will be happy to, to chat with, uh, with you if you have any questions. Thank you, Esteban. That's fantastic. It was really, really great talk and uh, well organized. And, um, and I, I think I'd like to keep the recording going uh, as we go, uh, go ahead and, and uh, take any questions. I think uh, we've got 23 people on, so I think we can kind of let people jump in. Uh, but feel free to raise your hand. And I see Joan has uh, jumped in with the first question. Go ahead, Joan. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, thank you. So you had mentioned that you have GPS nearby. I'm wondering if you have any estimate of what the velocity of the slide was doing at all this time. Yes, John, we have the GPS data and we have the velocity. We know exactly what is the velocity of the process. Unfortunately, I, I didn't include that in my talk, but I can send you that information uh, information uh, later by email. Cyril Mueller has a beautiful uh, GPS network and he recorded the, the entire process incredibly, incredibly well. And I will share that data with you as well. It's part of the... Um, of a, uh, um, a report that Javier Pacheco, Cyril Mueller, and others did. Yeah. And is it um, speeding up? It is speeding up. It's, yeah, you, you can see the acceleration of the of the mass with can time. You see it, can you see it actually stop in those 20 seconds? No, because the GPS data or the GPS stations are recording, I think, every hour. Uh, so it is impossible to see <laughs> and um, two other quick questions um mm -hmm. so my limited understanding is that this property of seismic efficiency basically scales with the propagation velocity so if you slip something faster it radiates more effectively and so it would get louder could that alone be an explanation for why it gets the amplitudes get bigger just because it's going faster and it's more seismically efficient? I, I I think so. And I think that correlates well with with the way I'm trying to understand the process. Um, it is faster, the loading rate is faster. Yes, the, the mass accelerated, but that acceleration at least in the way I'm trying to understand it, it is, is enough to provoke that some of the asperities along the landslide plane um, become seismic. And so the, the seismic contribution from different uh, small asperities, um, this, the, the entire sum of it, generates an increase in the number of LFEs and the number or and the amplitude of the of the of the signal but yeah i i do believe that the mass is accelerating with time as it as as the loading rate increases yeah that generates instability and that is instability well contributes as uh, the uh, contributes to the acceleration of the entire mass and so uh yeah gets the signal louder larger and then the last question just because geophysicists always ask about fluids is was the slide saturated and do you have any measure of what was going on in terms of the saturation uh, or the pressure? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I looked for uh, the water tables uh, 
rain conditions and it wasn't raining at the time. Um, so I'm not sure it was the, the ground was saturated with fluids. Um, um, I think that's that's what I know. Javier Pacheco might, might be, he, he might uh, know more about that, but I think I think it wasn't raining that much at the time of the of the landslide. Thank you. Great. No, thank you, John. Thank you for coming. If, uh, if I could ask a question. Um, that 20 second pause or stable sliding period is very remarkable. I, I just wouldn't have expected to see anything like that. Do you have any idea how far the mass went during that 20 seconds? Do we have any velocity? I wish. No, I, 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 um, I think we don't have an estimation or a robust estimation that how far it traveled or how far it went downhill during this, uh, during this period. Because uh, the deformation instruments or the GPS stations have a different um, sampling rate and uh, we couldn't record like the, the deformation during that time. Yeah, but it, I think it's mostly stable. I think so. I think it's mostly stable. And instead of traveling like super fast, uh, the deformation the is, is accommodated locally and, and the mass is not moving much, I think. In, in the uh, chat, um, Joan asks, is the slide continuing to move now? Uh, I, I believe the GPS stations are recording some deformation, some active deformation, yes. I'll just um, pipe in quickly, which is that the quiescent period, this is like at least the second study that showed the exact same thing in the Iceland. There's a, did maybe yes, I was in the car, maybe reference the Shopa paper. Yeah. Yeah. And they see it as four minutes instead of 30 seconds, but the exact same thing is observed in another landslide, which suggests well, it's in the end of two, but it seems like it's significant. Yeah, I actually had a question about that uh, period as well. And sort of um, going off of what, what Noah just mentioned, I find it interesting that like, yeah, in your case, there's a really, really abrupt drop in amplitude. And then there's just this really short sort of stable sliding phase. And then mm. I think that the, uh, the Gahat Fjords, the Greenland study you showed, didn't seem mm -hmm. to have much of that. And then the Iceland one had it, but there was a slower decrease of amplitude and a longer period. I think so, yes. So I guess what I'm curious about, like, is that, is this just like some sort of path effect based on, I don't know, the location of the, of the, um, the different stations or does it tell us something about the physics of the sliding or, the the material or like any any hypothesis on, on mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it could be both i believe because uh in these other studies uh the proximity of the stations to uh the epicenter of the landslides um is like some kilometers like 10 kilometers right here in Irasu volcano this is very near field the stations are meters away from the process so we actually are seeing the the near field what is happening so in in those cases i think could be both effect of the source of, of what is driven the process and uh, attenuation effects or path effects uh, of the seismic waves and right here we are seeing um i mean the effect of the source directly because we are like a couple of meters away from from the landslide so yeah it's it's I think it's the contribution of both processes. At least this is my understanding. If, if, if someone else to see it other ways, it would be great to understand it too. Esteban, can do you locate any of those earthquakes? I mean, did you, you have enough station? I mean, you did any of them, were any of them recorded at more than three stations and the largest events, you can see the largest low frequency earthquakes in three stations, but it's really hard to locate them using okay. traditional methods. I tried using antelope and um, 
the location is 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 bad. Yeah. I will need to, and and I talked to Javier about this, and we need to use a different methods for mm -hmm. uh, locating the low frequency earthquakes. Maybe, Maybe the correlation like back of back projection. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, back projection. What about the depth? What's the depth of the base of the of this landslide? You know, with the uh, base. The, yeah, the base. Um, we estimate that it is tens to hundreds of meters, but remember that this region has hosted landslides uh, during different years, and so the base is changing over time. Uh, and so the depth, yeah, is the depth is is changing is changing over time. But our um, estimation is that it could be between tens and hundreds of meters. Yeah, roughly speaking. So can you actually see surface waves? I mean, you'd expect with a source that shallow. I mean, it's really attenuating material, but I'm wondering. Yeah. You know. I haven't I haven't seen surface waves, especially because we're super close to the to the event. And in the case of surface waves, the distance is not enough, I believe, for for them to develop, uh, even though they are shallow. Or do you think? Uh, yeah, we can talk offline. I mean, yeah, you're certainly right, seeing sure. from my quarry explosions close, so. Okay. Uh, Javier had a, had a question. Oh, just just a comment. Um, the, the low frequency earthquakes or creeping events, those uh, were being recorded since 2011 before the you know, many years before the first uh, landslide. So these, uh, these events, some of them are, are very large and they were recorded all the way to more than 20 kilometers away. It was, uh, uh, but we had a very sparse network. We have though a few of those events recorded on a portable network that were installed for three months. Um, we did some locations in a very crude way. And yes, they are very shallow and they are right there on the on the la landslide area on the antennas area. So it's um, it's, it's not very easy to locate. We 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 did, we use uh, polarization to pin down where where the events were and try some amplitude uh, amplitude uh, location using the the envelope. And yes, they they are very shallow. They they locate right there, but the errors are really really large. Uh, the interesting thing is that these these uh, creeping events happened many years before the, the landslide, and when the Nicoya earthquake happened, a seven point six event uh, far away in the in the coast. Um, when that event happened, the rate of these creeping events increase. Uh, so the the time between events before uh, after the, the Nicoya event went down. They they we were recording something like one event every 24 hours, 23 hours. And uh, after the Nicoya event it went to uh, record one event every 10 hours. Then it started increasing again. At, uh, and in December of that year, 2012, uh, the rate went back to one event every 20 hours, 24 hours or so. So it's, it's interesting the, the behavior of this uh, creeping events, uh, and, it's, uh, and it will be interesting to to study in more detail. We we do have some some uh, data nearby with a. Uh, portable array for three months. And the University of Costa Rica also has a network that was installed there and recorded those events, uh, a tight network, and uh, for about a, another three or six months. So it would be interesting to study these type of events. Thank you for the input, Javier. Noah? <clears throat> yeah. Um... 
I, the, the transient embrittlement thing seems pretty crucial to the sort of interpretation you're making. And I like, what is that? Is, it, is this something that like happens? I mean, I, it's very appealing and understanding what materials are prone to it and under what conditions it occurs is something that's obviously really interesting. Do you, is there, is this something that seismologists like have experiments where they observe or is this something you appeal to but we don't really know what the process actually is? That way? All right, so that's a good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most of the observations for transient embryolment are in laboratory experiments. And from that, uh, Chris Maron has a bunch of observations uh, showing the transition from velocity strengthening to velocity weakening uh, frictional conditions. And they attribute that to uh, transient embryolments. And he's intimately related to the stiffness or this stiffness ratio that we know um, and how the biology of the material changes uh, as it is exposed to uh, strain rates, different strain rates. Um, and so from that, I think seismologists adopted or recognized the importance of the observations in the lab and tried to apply it to uh, the change in the recurrence time for repeating earthquakes. Um, I'm trying to go back in time to remember the papers that talk about uh, transient embrittlement, and um, most of them, most of the papers that talk about that process in seismology are papers that work on repeating earthquakes. And so we see change in the uh, recurrence interval of repeating earthquakes and also change in magnitude of the repeating earthquakes when these events are triggered by large uh, transient events like uh, earthquakes, like the Tohoku earthquake, for instance. Uh, right after the Tohoku earthquakes, there is an increase in amplitude of the repeating earthquakes um, that have been recognized to happen in a particular region in Japan. And uh, before the Tohoku earthquakes, the magnitude of these events are is pretty stable. And right after, there is an exponential increase in magnitude that eventually goes back to pre-earthquake uh, levels and so yeah from that I, I, I believe I believe that most of the observations are, are from uh, laboratory experiments uh, yes okay. which with important implications for tectonic faults of course and in yeah. Tohoku remember the, the the most convincing thing that I found was there were new repeating earthquakes that were that appeared just yes. after. You know, you know, from in the after slip zone of Tohoku that lasted for a few years and then stopped and have not been seen since. But, but that's a <clears throat> that's an interpretation that the the stre the static stresses didn't change after the Tohoku earthquake, but rather it's loading the loading rate. The, the loading rate. Slip. So this, yeah, it was the. Okay, so so I see. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, in the after slip zone. So these mm -hmm. these patches. That were before, you know, conditionally stable and had not been slipping and right, repeating it. earthquakes had a series of many repeating earthquakes, and there's many families that then died out. Okay. Right. The 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 loading rate increases during the after sleep episode. Well, it increases with the earthquake, but then the after sleep episodes also increases the loading rate, and so. Um, changes the frictional conditions of some of the uh, asperities in in the fall zone rupturing or or changing from uh, velocity strengthening to velocity weakening so one one thing i'm trying to trying to square in my head here so it's your 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 low frequency earthquake uh recurrence interval graph that has that just incredibly uh tight line on it um I think it also has a doubling line. I, I, I think that if, if you know that you have to squint a little bit, but I think you, you see a, a, a preference, you know, for when there is these longer periods between them, maybe it's they're they're often uh, twice as long, which makes me wonder if maybe we're missing a few events. But if you have multiple patches, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how do you get like, I mean, that would make perfect sense if you had this simple little diagram where you have just one asperity and then there's slip around it and that slip is speeding up. It's gonna load that asperity more quickly. The interval between uh, ruptures is going to decrease. That would be really, really straightforward. But if you have a whole mess of these, 
And they aren't even individual families that maybe reflect the single asperity. They don't particularly have that great of regularity, I mean, maybe a little bit, but they're more, you know, your total slip was somewhat continuous, but the, the time spacing between them was really complex. I, and so anyway, I, I find that really baffling. And like, I, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on how, how do you set this kind of slide wide, you know, uh, recurrence interval for what are presumably really localized low frequency earthquakes? That is an interesting question. Um, so the way I try to see it, I try to see it is um, individually. And um, I see that before when, when the loading rates are low, a very small or very yeah a very small set of patches are rupturing but increasingly the when when the strain rate increases the the frictional conditions are changed along the way along different regions of the path or uh, the fault plane um yeah um the the recurrence interval for all of these different patches are going to be different and how they or how the recurrence interval is modulated um, essentially uh, will depend on the frictional strength and stress drop of the fault patches. Um, but um, I don't know if that answers the question or I'm, I'm a little bit lost here. Um, so what do you think here? Hey? Where are you thinking? Would, would would this would it have to do with like let's say you have a system with three asperities, you know? Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, presumably, so if they were widely separated, they would maybe behave totally independently, and so maybe each would have its own recurrence interval, and you would see those kind of interfingering. But if they're somewhat closer together, then. Uh, and I mean, you know, if, if your suggestion is correct that the, that that silent period just before catastrophic failure relates to uh, a, an overall system wide strengthening, that suggests that these asperities do have some capacity to influence the surrounding strain strengthening. Oh, I see. Okay. So maybe you could transfer information, basically. I, I, I almost, I'm almost thinking of it in an information sense. Like if you have some, yes. if they're going to be, if they're going to have this system-wide frequency, then they have to transfer information. One has to say, well, I just slipped, so you wait a little while. So they communicate, our... yes, they, yeah, they yeah. communicate. And, and it's an effect that has has been shown in, in different papers, uh, in numerical models as well. Nadia Alpusta has shown how uh, repeating earthquakes interact, so how the occurrence of one event affects the after sleep of a previous event and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, uh, I believe that for this stable sliding period, uh, the full patches has to be close to each other in order to communicate information and provide stability of the, to the system. Otherwise, it would be it would be difficult to observe this kind of stability. If the full patches are separated, let's say for hundreds of meters, you wouldn't have this because the system otherwise would be weak enough to go, you know, instantly. Uh, but when you have full patches in close proximity, like less than meters away from each other with similar frictional properties, that's enough to provide uh, some to increase the frictional strength of the fall of the of the matrix and provide stability to the system. That's how I think about it. Yes. Just to follow that that thread just a little bit further, I, I wonder, you know, your your um, your frequency diagram. Like, I wonder if you went to like sub one hertz frequencies. Like, can you are, are they like as you start getting into where these are happening really frequently? Are there low frequency like you know periods of you know a second or seconds, multiple seconds, tens of seconds that. Yeah, that might express some of that uh, that interaction when when you start getting to that tremor level, that interaction between these complex networks of asperities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, the tremor itself is showing that uh, repeating the, the, the low frequency earthquakes or the patches that generate these events are interacting. And so the, the, the waveforms merge and forming this very dramatic signal, this chaotic signal um, from the different or from the individual full patches. Yeah, so eventually in the long period is the long period is capturing this this interaction, this full interaction between all the, the in individuals uh, full patches to generate the low frequency earthquakes. Thanks, very interesting. Are there are there, there are other questions? Well, wow. no? okay. I really, really appreciate that everyone was able to to join in. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to throw in at the end here, Esteban? Oh man, I'm so grateful. Thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity. Um, I tried to to make the talk like very um, simple, so we all can understand what's happening. Um, I'll be happy to talk to you, any of you individually, if you want me to. If you if you have any tip or any recommendation, please let me know. I'm super grateful to be here and, and have the opportunity to talk to, to all of you. So thank you very much.